Thank you, James. I was uh, once in a former life the dean of the law school, and one of the uh, pleasures of that position was the opportunity to witness so many of the achievements of our student organizations. Whoever first said that learning takes place uh, as much outside the classroom as inside uh, was surely speaking about the University of Virginia School of Law. And the primary vehicles for the self-education of our students are the student journals, among which the Journal of Law and Politics has an especially honored place in rich history. Today's event on the voting wars, the Journal of Law and Politics has brought together an impressive array of experts and commentators, including our own Dan Ortiz and Michael Gilbert, Keisha Gaskins from the Brennan Center, John Fortier, director of the Democracy Project, presided over by our old friend Joe Birkenhead, formerly chief counsel to the DNC and now with Kaplan and Drysdale. And that's only the morning's agenda. Much more is to follow after lunch. The luncheon speaker who will deliver the keynote for your conference is Richard L. Hassan, the Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science at the astonishingly successful new law school at the University of California at Irvine. I believe UCI is graduating their first Just year. This past May. This past May, graduated their first class. Rick Hassan is a star in the firmament of that institution and one of the main reasons why it has gone from zero to 60 faster than any other law school in history. Rick has done three things, which in combination, at least, are the envy of academics everywhere. First, he has established an impressive academic reputation in his field. His Michigan article on Citizens United is a classic in that increasingly overwritten area. His 2012 Stanford article on lobbying, rent-seeking, and the Constitution is superb. And there's a superb review essay published in the Harvard Law Review in the same year. In addition to being a productive, insightful, and successful scholar, Rick has been splendidly farsighted in choosing what to write about. Many of us in the academy end up laboring in fallow pastures. Students know it well. How often do you as students encounter professors whose idea of an interesting topic, shall we say, is, shall we say, uh, unusual? Uh, professors who stand up and really believe that what they have to say about Erie Railroad or Burford abstention, I'm picking things I talk about, people who stand up and talk about those things as if they were endlessly fascinating, even when the evidence from the classroom suggests the contrary. <laughs> Rick Hassan's specialty, however, is a subject of intense national interest, and not merely in the academy. The train wreck election of Bush versus Gore in 2000, the heightened sensitivity to all things electoral and the aftermath of that decision, the explosive, indeed, in my view, transformative rise in the amount of money being spent on political campaigns, the Supreme Court's vindication of the money free speech rights of corporations and unions and Citizens United, and the inexorable rise of the technological capability to devise and implement a host of localized strategies for national political campaigns all these developments have combined to make Rick Hassan's field the hottest topic in American constitutional law. He is a big fish in a very big pond. And finally, Rick has had the wit and the energy to seize this opportunity and to transform himself into that being which every American law teacher secretly longs to become the public intellectual. He writes not only for Michigan, Stanford, and Harvard Law Reviews, but also for Reuters, Slate, The New York Times, and The New Republic. His is a voice heard not only within the academic fraternity, but also increasingly across the nation. Listened to not only by students and colleagues, but also by those in the corridors of power and in the eye of public opinion. 
That is not to say that we as a nation have the sense to follow Rick's advice, but eventually we may, and we would be the better for it, for your keynote speaker, Professor Rick Hassan. Thank you, John, for that uh, generous introduction and for setting uh, the um, bar, uh, the expectation so low. I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, uh, before the election, I uh, went, I think I gave 30 talks about my book, uh, The Voting Wars. Um, since the election, this is my second, uh, which tells you how the public's interest is. Every four years, I get calls in October from the press saying, why haven't things gotten any better? I said, because you guys haven't been paying attention for the last three years and 10 months. Uh, and it's cyclical. Uh, but a lot happened in the 2012 election, and so although I'm going to talk about a part of my book, I'm going to update it and talk about what's happened in the 2012 election. My book came out uh, last summer. Uh, and uh, I, I just, uh, before beginning, I, I want to thank uh, the Journal of Law and Politics, James, and the entire uh, staff of the, of the Journal of Law and Politics for putting this event together. I'm, I'm honored to be the keynote speaker. Um, but I, I'm especially honored to do it for the Journal of Law and Politics, which I think has been, uh, and I say this as uh, the former co-editor of a competing journal, the Election Law Journal, I think Journal of Law and Politics has been uh, a consistent place for very uh, important and perceptive writing about election law, lobbying, and related topics. And I always uh, anxiously await the new issues. So I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to be part uh, of the journal and of this event. Uh, so. Uh, uh, my book starts, and I'll, I'll start here, by asking you to imagine a close election. It's, uh, it's close to election day between uh, the Democrat, uh, uh, Democratic candidate for president and the Republican candidate for president. Uh, the, uh, uh, the polls are close, and the pundits predict that the election is going to come down to the battleground state of Wisconsin. And uh, things are very uh, bitter there. As you know, it was the scene of a series of recall elections, uh, became very... Uh, uh, focus of national attention when uh, a, a, um, a bill to, uh, to limit the power of public sector unions passed. Uh, the election comes down to, uh, to the state of Wisconsin, and uh, uh, the uh, vote totals start coming in. And one of the things you learn about elections, if you follow the vote totals, is we don't have a single election for president. We actually have thousands of elections for president taking place in different jurisdictions, using different rules, different ways of uh, counting casting the votes, different methods for counting the votes. And so the vote totals start coming in. The lead is seesawing between the Democrat and the Republican all night. And at about 2 o'clock in the morning, when all the results from the beginning have come in, we're still waiting for uh, absentee ballots and other votes to be counted, uh, the Democrat is ahead by uh, a 200-vote uh, margin out of millions of votes cast. At this point, uh, conservatives uh, take to the airwaves and to the blogosphere and start complaining about voter fraud. Uh, John Fund, a noted conservative commentator, goes on Opinion Journal and talks about what he calls, quote, bizarre voting anomalies uh, in Dane County, home of the University of uh, Wisconsin at Madison, the hotbed of liberalism uh, that it is. And he talks about a history of voter fraud in what he calls urban areas of uh, Milwaukee. Soon the, the Twitterverse and the blogosphere light up with conservatives saying that Democrats are going to steal the election. The next morning, a woman named Kathy Nicholas uh, holds a press conference. She is the chief uh, election official in Waukesha uh, County, Wisconsin. And I say Waukesha deliberately because I started saying Waukesha, I presented this in Chicago and got stares like I had violated a, some cardinal rule. Waukesha County, Wisconsin. And uh, she holds this press conference that she says, you know, uh, I was collecting the vote totals from around uh, the county on my laptop, and it turns out when I was transmitting the numbers, I forgot the entire city of Brookfield with its 15,000 voters. And when you add in those 15,000 voters to the vote totals, it turns out that the Democrat is not ahead in the state by 200, but the Republican is ahead by 7,000 votes. Now it was Democrats' turn to complain. John Fund was quiet, but the Democrats were complaining. Kathy Nicholas, who used to work for the Republican legislature, has now uh, saved the day for the Republican candidate. The liberal blog Think Progress 
writing about this event says, quote, critics are saying there are only two possible explanations for this bizarre development, foul play or incompetence. The URL is a little more blunt. It reads, Kathy Nicholas, crook or idiot. <laughs> Nicholas holds a press conference where she uh, defends herself. And standing behind her, as you might see, is a, a woman named Ramona Kissinger. Her job is to be the Democrat who literally looks over the shoulder of the Republican to make sure that everything's OK. And she stands there like a fine piece of furniture and nods her head and says everything's fine. But uh, a day later, the Democratic uh, Party of Wisconsin issues a statement for her. And it's kind of interesting that the party is issuing a statement for an election official. And the statement reads, I am 80 years old, and I don't understand anything about computers. I don't know where the numbers Kathy was showing me ultimately came from, but they seem to add up. I'm still very, very confused. Now, the story I've just told you is true. Everything I just told you was true. Only the election has been changed. This was the election for state Supreme Court justice in 2011. And it was a race between the incumbent David Prosser, a Republican, former uh, Republican legislative leader. Kathy Nicholas used to work for David Prosser. And uh, a, a woman named Joanne Kloppenberg, who was a Democrat. And the race seesawed back and forth. It was very bitter. This is an ad, you can see, that was run by the unions against David Prosser, because everybody knew that control of the state Supreme Court turned on this race, and whether that union law was going to be upheld or not depended on this race. Uh, and uh, Prosser was declared the winner. The, the state election board did a, an investigation of Kathy Nicholas, and they determined something that I talk about in my book all the time. This was a case of Hanlon's razor, a computer science principle. Don't attribute to malfeasance that which can be explained by incompetence. That is, the problem here was that she didn't know what she was doing, not that she was trying to steal the election. Kloppenberg eventually conceded. The state Supreme Court went on to uphold the union law against challenge. Meanwhile, Prosser and other justices on the court got into continued altercations that have involved the state police. And we know that Prosser's hands ended up on the neck of another justice and the investigation is trying to determine, this is all true, whether or not it was self-defense or an attack during deliberations over the uh, union law. So things have gotten, in very happy, uh, friendly Midwestern Wisconsin, things have gotten very bitter. And so the question I, I uh, like to ask is, and I ask this book, is 12 years after Bush versus Gore, uh, could Florida 2000 happen again? And if it did, uh, would it be worse? And can I just see by a show of hands, how many of you recognize this picture? OK. And how many of you don't? Fair number, you don't. It's a generational divide. Uh, so I used to teach Bush versus Gore as a current event, and now I teach it as history. And uh, this is an election judge trying to determine whether or not uh, there is a valid vote for um, Bush or Gore on one of these punch card machines with its hanging and pregnant chads. Uh, one of the points I make in the book uh, which I won't go into right now, is that the rise of social media would make the next election meltdown much worse. We didn't have social media in 2000, and thank God that we did. So before I get into the details, I want to talk about why does it matter? Why do we care about uh, our elections uh, and how well they're run? Uh, and so I want to point out the Egyptian election. I got this information from Wikipedia, which is where I get most of my information. And um, this tells us about the 1993, I'm sorry, 2005 presidential race in Egypt between Hosni Mubarak, the incumbent, and Ayman Noor, uh, the challenger. You all remember the Noor race, Noor with Noor, you know. Didn't do that well. Um, Noor polled a scant 7.3% of the vote uh, compared to 88.6% of the vote for Hosni Mubarak. Um, pretty good showing for Mubarak, but not quite as good as the next election where he got 100% of the vote. So, you know, he had, he had room to improve. Uh, and I point this out because we see these numbers and we know they're not real. And we know that the, in order to have a democracy with, uh, with legitimacy, we need to have confidence in the fairness of the process. And confidence that the way the votes are being cast and counted is being done fairly and accurately. Without fraud, without incompetence. And we know what happens when it doesn't work out that way. So here's Tahrir Square. And at some point, the Egyptian people had enough of a dictator. And it can't always happen in places where there are dictators. So here's uh, Tahrir Square, and this is what happens, and what we continue to see happening in Egypt 
when people are not convinced that the democratic process is working. And here's Russia, December 2011, when it was uh, widely seen that uh, Putin had uh, cooked the results to pad his, his um, uh, parliamentary uh, majority. And then here's the United States in 2011. At top is a Tea Party rally. I don't know if you can read the sign. No Chicago-style politics in Texas. Voter ID works for me. And at the bottom, a union rally in uh, Philadelphia. Voter ID equals a poll tax. These are the voting wars uh, that have hit the United States. And it all goes back to Florida 2000. So some of you may not recognize this picture, but this was a very recognizable individual once. This is uh, Catherine Harris. She was the chief election officer of Florida at the time of the 2000 election. Uh, called the Secretary of State, but her job, one of her jobs was to run the election. Not only was she elected as a Republican in a, a partisan election, the way we do it in uh, 33 states in the United States, she was also the honorary co-chair of the Bush for President Election Committee, and she was not the only one to do that. In fact, uh, a later investigation showed that a phone call was made from her cell phone to Governor Bush. George Bush's brother was governor of the state. I mean, you couldn't make these facts up. No one would believe this if it were a movie. Uh, a phone call was made from her cell phone to Governor Bush from Republican Party headquarters the night of the election. And so, how, why were you calling the governor? You know, you're supposed to be counting the votes. And her answer was, well, I was at the Republican Victory Party, and Al Cardenas, who was chair of the, of the party, barred my phone and made the call. I didn't make the call. I had a great explanation, except for the fact, why is the person who's supposed to be counting the votes at one of the party's victory parties on the night of the election? And we learned that partisanship in Florida went all the way down. So when they later had to count those votes, it turns out that the standards they adopted for recounting those votes in Democratic counties were very generous for Gore. And whether you were a Democrat or Republican counting those votes, you were much more likely to find votes for Gore if you were a Democrat than you were a Republican. We also learned a lot about problems with our voting technology. So this is the famous butterfly ballot adopted by a woman named Teresa Lepore who was running the election in Palm Beach County, a woman who was uh, a Democrat. And uh, she saw there were so many candidates on the ballot for president in Florida that we need to do something about uh, the font size, because I've got a lot of elderly voters, she said. I need to make the font bigger so people can see it. So I'm going to put the, the, uh, the, the names of the candidates on both sides of the ballot. And let's see if this pointer works. So you can see the different holes you're supposed to punch out with a little pin or stylus to punch out into the punch card. And you can see it says uh, George Bush, President, Dick Cheney, Vice President, is a whole number three. It says Al Gore, President, Joe Liebman, Vice President, Democrat up here. And you see right here, five, or this whole four. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe you vote four for Democrat, maybe you vote one for Gore, one for Lieberman. Turns out that if you were voting whole four, you were voting for Pat Buchanan, the Reform Party candidate. This led to the famous Jews for Buchanan vote in Palm Beach County. Even, even uh, Pat Buchanan said, these people were not voting for me. Thousands of people. And even more people than voting for Buchanan were the thousands of people who voted twice, put two, punched hole four and five, one for Gore, one for Lieberman, that ballot didn't count. So what did we learn about Florida? We learned that partisanship infected the process. You had the Democratic Attorney General, for example, Bob Butterworth, issuing opinions on what he thought election law meant, opinions which helped the Democrats and which were going against what Catherine Harris said, never mind that Butterworth's job did not include issuing opinions in this area. You had localism. So you had different rules in different places and rules changing and people lobbying to change the rules. You had technology problems. And it ended with an out-of-court, uh, an out-of-control court subverting American democracy. Everybody agrees on this point. They just disagree as to which court. The Republicans think it was the Florida Supreme Court, and the Democrats think it was the US Supreme Court. And what has this led to? Well, one thing it's led to is armies of lawyers. So the amount of election litigation has more than doubled in the period before 2000 to the period after 2000. So we are litigating much more frequently. That is, uh, for good or for bad, that is uh, a fact. And it has affected, this churn about our elections has affected people's confidence in the fairness of the election process. So the National Election Study, the gold standard of public opinion around elections, they asked people, how fairly do you think the, the presidential election was run? And we have a great baseline, because they asked it in 1996, before all these problems started. And you can see in 1996, about 10% of the people thought the way the election was run was, was somewhat un, or very unfair. Look what happens in 2000, it jumps up. Of course it jumps up, 2000 was this contested election, but look at 2004. That's when Bush runs for re-election against Kerry. 21.5% of Democrats, compared to only 3% of Republicans, think the way the election was run was unfair. 
Now let's contrast that with what happened in Washington State when they had a contested governor's race in, in 2004, where first the Republican uh, was declared the winner, then there was a recount, the Republican was declared the winner again, it went to court, and the Democrat was ultimately declared the winner. Well, how unfair is the election? 68% of Republicans thought it was unfair compared to only 27% of Democrats. The lesson is clear. If my guy won, the election was done fair and square. If your guy run, run, there must have been some fraud or mismanagement. And this even has affected uh, the public's confidence in the fairness of the election process by race. So look at this 2004 Pew study. 63% of whites compared to 30% of African Americans are very confident in how, that their votes are going to be accurately counted. 8% of whites compared to 29% of African Americans are not at all confident that their votes are going to be accurately counted. So after Florida, we've seen allegations of voter fraud, allegations of voter suppression, problems with partisanship and localism in election administration, and technology issues. Um, we also see the rise of social media. My book talks about all of these. I'm going to focus on the first two, the issues we heard a little bit about this morning, <coughs> fraud versus uh, suppression. So the fight over voter ID. Uh, so here's a guy named Mario Gallegos. And when I presented this at UCLA, I said Gallegos. And I was corrected there that it's Gallegos. Mario Gallegos was a state senator in uh, Texas, Democrat. And uh, he was in uh, Houston recovering from a liver transplant. He's having some complications. Doctor said, stay, stay in the hospital. But he had to be brought up to Austin and was kept in a hospital bed in the uh, Capitol Rotunda, and wheeled in to filibuster the Republican voter ID law. That's how bitter this has become. They needed every vote of the Democrats to block the ID law. So for years, the Democrats used all kinds of procedural tricks to block voter ID law. And Gallegos, who actually just passed away from his liver disease this past year, was an outspoken opponent of voter ID laws. He called it an old, uh, the Karl Rove trick is back again, the Republican Party seeing census numbers in the Latino communities voting in record numbers. This is the last gasp to suppress the vote. Well, after a while, the Democrats' luck ran out. Their procedural tricks to try and stop voter ID from being enacted uh, failed. And Governor Perry signed the voter ID law. Today, with the signing of this bill, we take a major step forward in securing the integrity of the ballot box and protecting the most cherished right we enjoy as citizens. The Republican side, voter ID necessary for integrity. Not so fast, though, says Eric Holder, the uh, Attorney General of the United States, because Texas has a history of discrimination in voting on the basis of race. It has to submit all of its changes to the Department of Justice or to a three-judge court for approval to make sure that the law is not going to make minority voters worse off. Holder issued a statement. He said, not really a problem with voter fraud. This is going to suppress the vote. We're blocking the law. Texas challenged the law went to a three-judge court in D.C. The three-judge court blocked the law. Texas said, okay, we're going to the Supreme Court. And one of the arguments, as uh, Keisha Gaskins mentioned this morning, one of the arguments that is being made is that the Voting Rights Act is no longer constitutional. That's an argument that's at issue in the Shelby County case. And you can see the uh, headline from the New York Times, conservative justices voice skepticism on voting law. So by the time the Supreme Court gets to the Texas case, which it's been holding, uh, it could well be that the court will say, we don't need to address whether or not this violates Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act because Section 5 is unconstitutional. And then Texas law, Texas's voter ID law, which allows you to use a concealed weapons permit but not a college ID to vote, will go into effect, subject to additional court challenge. So how did we get there? How did we get to the point where we have, uh, as uh, one of the panelists put it, I think maybe it was John put it this morning, red state election law and blue state election law? Republican states passing voter ID, Democratic states like my state of California passing same-day voter registration. How do we get that way? Well, voter fraud was not a big national issue before 2000, but it became one after 2000. So two days before um, uh, Republican uh, House uh, Administration Chair Bob Ney, who later went to jail for Abramoff-related improprieties, was holding a hearing about the help, what became the Help America Vote Act. A group was formed that no one had ever heard of, a group called the American Center for Voting Rights. American Center for Voting Rights popped up two days before this hearing. Two years later, it disappeared. I mean disappeared, I mean they took down everything. This is from the Internet Wayback Machine. Uh, you know, nothing ever dies on the Internet. They wiped everything out. The guy, Thor Hearn, who was the head of this organization for two years, 
Go look him up. He's at Arndt Fox, a very prominent DC firm. You will see he scrubbed his resume of having worked for this organization. No mention. He'll mention that he testified before the Carter Baker Commission, but not that he testified for this American Center for Voting Rights. The American Center for Voting Rights was formed primarily to make the case that voter fraud was a big problem, and so restrictive laws need to be put in place. So here's from their now defunct website. And I don't know if you could see this smiling, bald African American guy with the earring. I tried to track him down. This is a stock photo from uh, Getty Photos. Tried to see if he was happy that he was smiling on this page. The Ohio report states third party organizations, especially ACT, ACORN, and the NAACP, engage in a coordinated get out the vote effort. A significant component of this effort appears to be registering individuals who would cast ballots for the candidates supported by these organizations. This voter registration effort was not limited to the registration of legal voters, but criminal investigations and news reports suggest that this voter registration effort was also involved in the registration of thousands of fictional voters, such as the now infamous Jive F. Turkey Sr., Dick Tracy, and Mary Poppins. These individuals, those individuals registering as fictional voters were reportedly paid not just money to do so, but were in at least one instance paid in crack cocaine. That story's actually true, and I tracked it down. And it turns out that the woman who paid the crack cocaine herself died of a drug overdose, and so we never got to the bottom of the story. But guilty plea in that single case. But an epidemic of voter fraud committed, you can hear, by minorities. There's a reason it says Jive F. Turkey, Jr. There's a subtle or not so subtle racism in a lot of this literature. But all of a sudden, the idea that there's a lot of voter fraud and it's being committed by Democrats became part of the mainstream Republican orthodoxy. So here's Michelle Malkin the conservative commentator in 2010. Denial is not just a river in Egypt, it's the Democrats' coping me mechanism for election uh, voter fraud. Faced with multiple reports of early voting irregularities and election shenanigans across the country, left-wing groups are playing deaf, dumb, and blind. Voter fraud? What voter fraud? Now, if you remember the 2010 midterm election, that's when Democrats took what President Obama called a shellacking. Republicans made great gains in that election. What did Michelle Malkin have to say about the voter fraud affecting that election once the Republicans won? Nothing, because voter fraud? What voter fraud? When voter fraud happens, it must be done by Democrats. Just before the same election, Dick Armey, former congressional leader, speaking at the uh, Lincoln Club in Orange County, said 3% of ballots cast in elections were fraudulent Democratic ballots. Just the number apparently made up from thin air. Quote, I'm tired of people being Republican all of their lives and then changing parties when they die. That was the joke. Got a big laugh there. So uh, where did this come from? How much voter fraud is there? And do we need things like ID to attract it? So uh, there's a guy named Hans von Spakovsky who was mentioned this morning. He's worked at the Justice Department. He's worked at the Federal Election Commission. He's now at the Heritage Report. He's one of the people who I call a member of the fraudulent fraud squad who's out there pushing the idea that voter fraud is a major problem which uh, needs voter ID. So how extensive is it? I've been looking for cases where impersonation fraud, I go to the polls and I say, I'm John Fortier, and I try and vote for John Fortier. How often does this happen? So couldn't find a lot of cases of this happening at all. Couldn't find any cases where it's affecting elections. And I started looking, I went back all the way to 1980. Couldn't find a single election. So John Fund wrote a report for the Heritage Foundation, then uh, put up on Fox News. And uh, what he said is that uh, one doesn't have to look far to find instances of fraudulent ballots cast in actual elections by, quote, voters who are figments of active imaginations. In 1984, a district attorney in Brooklyn, New York, a Democrat, released the findings of a grand jury report that reported extensive registration and impersonation fraud between 1968 and 82. First of all, 1984, not exactly recent, but OK, between 68 and 82. Extensive impersonation fraud, grand jury report. So I look for the grand jury report, I can't find it. So I write to Justin Levin, who collects all this stuff. He doesn't have it. I write to Lori Manite, who wrote a great book called The Myth of Voter Fraud. She doesn't have it. Nobody has it. So I wrote to Von Spakovsky, who's, who had written to me before to plug stuff on my election law blog. He wrote to me yesterday to complain to me about uh, something I wrote in <laughs> Slate about him. Uh, and uh, I said, I'd like to see the grand jury report. Silence. I wrote to him again, I'd like to see the grand jury report. Silence. So I wrote to the head of the Heritage Foundation. I said, you know, one of the things about social science is you need to be able to replicate your data. You know, you make a claim, you need to be able to have it. Silence. So I went to Talking Points Memo, and they did a little story about it. And, uh, you know, he, he's blo blocking this report. It's a great story because Von Spakovsky is one of the favorite targets of the left. They love to attack him. And uh, I was all set to go on the Rachel Maddow show. It was very going to be very exciting to talk about him. But then the grand jury report appeared. Uh, Joy Shoemaker, the uh, law librarian at the excellent new UCI Law School. 
Thank you for that. My dean will be very happy about uh, those remarks. Uh, the, uh, she found someone in the Brooklyn DA's office who found the report, faxed it to the library. Within an hour, we had it posted on the election law blog. What did it show? Extensive impersonation fraud? No, there was some impersonation fraud where election officials were involved, but nothing where people uh, were showing up at the polls in some kind of conspiracy, claiming to be someone else, and tricking election officials. Didn't happen. What did happen? There was a lot of bad stuff that happened, especially at the Brooklyn Board of Elections. My favorite story in the report is how there was a reformist candidate running against the Brooklyn machine. And the machine was worried that this guy was going to get the nomination. If you got the nomination for the Democratic Party, you were going to win the election in Brooklyn, a very heavy a Democratic population. So they went into the bathroom of the Brooklyn Board of Elections, and they hid in the ceiling panels above the bathroom until the uh, uh, lights were turned out for the night. And then they climbed down out of the bathroom, and they went and they changed voter registration cards of the people they thought would have voted for the reformers candidate in the hope that if it was a close election, they could point to the cards and show that there was a mismatch of the, the signatures and get things thrown out. Yeah, that happened. It happened in, I think, 1970-something. It happened. It had nothing to do with impersonation fraud. It has nothing to do with a voter ID, but it did happen. But that's what the report showed, and that must be why Von Spakovsky didn't want to share the report with me. But remember, this is his evidence of a recent problem with impersonation fraud. Uh, so uh, Jane Mayer did an interview with Von Spakovsky. First of all, she said, why didn't you turn over the report? And Von Spakovsky's response was, what am I, Hassan's research assistant? That was an interesting response. But then she said, tell me the names of any credible election experts who think that impersonation fraud is a major problem. So she said, he said, sure. Bob Pastor, who's uh, at uh, American University, and Larry Sabato, who's right here at Virginia. When I reached Pastor, because Pastor had indicated that he uh, had a problem voting once, they made a mistake. It was, he added, quote, I don't think that voter impersonation fraud is a serious problem. Sabato, reading down at the next paragraph, who supports the use of voter IDs under the same basic conditions, uh, that is where, uh, where the forms are, uh, the, 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 the uh, ID is provided free and the government makes every effort to get it out there. Quote, this is Sabato, one fraudulent vote is too many, but my sense is that it's relatively rare today. So these are the people that Von Spakovsky pointed to to show that this is a major problem. As I said, for my book, I looked to find a single case where an election has been affected, an outcome, by impersonation fraud, couldn't find one. So let me tell you about a real case that just happened in Texas this past year involving impersonation fraud. It's election day. Dad's out of town. Mom takes son, who's junior, same name as dad, but junior, takes him to the polling place to vote for dad in dad's place, because dad's out of town. He votes, pretends he's dad. Same day, dad comes home early from the business trip. On his way home from the business trip, he goes and stops at the, uh, at the polling place and tries to vote, and turns out someone's already voted. Mom is indicted. That case is still pending, so far as I can tell. A coordinated effort to swing an election? No. Most of, fortunately for us, and we were talking about this last night, most criminals are idiots, and they don't know how to commit fraud. And this kind of fraud would be very hard to do. So how do we know how much this is a problem? Well, here's some evidence. For five years, the Department of Justice made pursuing voter fraud a major focus. This is during the Bush years. How much voter fraud did they find? Well, they found maybe a hundred and something cases. How many involved impersonation fraud? Zero. Texas, major investigation, two years. How much involving impersonation fraud? Zero. Great study by, uh, uh, let me come here. Great study by a group called News 21. Uh, they asked every DA in the country, every DA's office, send us all your election crimes since 2000. We want to hear about all of them. Not a random sample, all of them. Here's what they found. 491 absentee ballot cases. See it up there? Made up. No, that's not working. 23.7% of all of the accusations. Let's see, where is voter impersonation fraud? Not here, not here, not here. Oh, there it is at the bottom. You can't even see it. It's cut off. 0.5%. Of These are allegations. These are not even convictions. Why is that? Well, here's the reason. If I want to steal an election, there are two ways I'm going to do it. One way is, I'm an election official. I'm going to count the votes. So in Cudahy, California, which is a small city in Southern California, the ballots would come into City Hall to be counted. City workers, at the direction of election officials, would open up those ballots secretly. 
they'd steam open the ballots. If there were votes for incumbents, they'd reseal the ballots. If there were votes for um, challengers, they'd throw away the ballots. That's a good way to steal an election. It's pretty efficient. If you're counting the votes, you change who's voting. Sure. And that's a major problem. Election officials, that can, that's serious. So we have to have checks on election officials. That's one thing that happens. The other thing that happens is absentee ballot fraud. And this was mentioned this morning by John uh, Fortier. Here's an example, one of my favorite examples, of the race for county commissioner in Dodge County, Georgia. Uh, the two candidates were McCraney and Mullis. Incredibly, each, in the, each of the two camps, McCraney and Mullis, actually set up tables inside the courthouse at opposite ends of the hall where supporters on both sides openly bid uh, against each other to buy absentee ballots. At trial, a Dodge County magistrate described the rowdy courthouse atmosphere during the absentee voting period as a successful flea market. One of the vote buyers in the Mullis camp also testified that open bidding for votes was like an auction. Vote buyers for both sides paid the voter $20 to $40 after the voter cast his or her absentee ballot. Sometimes the cash payment occurred in the courthouse, more frequently, the voters received their payment while the haulers drove them home after they voted. Why would this be? Why would absentee ballot fraud be more prevalent than impersonation fraud? Well, the whole reason we have the secret ballot is to prevent, the, well, honestly, the whole reason, a major reason we have the secret ballot is to prevent people from being able to engage in this kind of transaction. Because if I want to pay you $20 to vote for Smith, if I have the absentee ballot, I can either write Smith in myself or I can look to make sure you did. If you go to the polling place, how do I know that you voted? How do I know you don't go in every time and pretend you vote and try and collect $20 from a bunch of people? Uh, I can't verify who you voted for if you actually did vote. And so it's not as though if you were trying to commit this kind of fraud, it would be easier to do than absentee ballot fraud. It would be harder to do. And it would be easy to detect. You'd need a lot of people going to the polling place to do this. It's just not the kind of thing that people would do if they want to steal an election, which is why the statistics are so lopsided when you look what happened. No reason to think absentee ballot fraud would be easier to find than impersonation fraud. We have absentee ballot fraud prosecutions every year. And they do swing elections. In fact, the 1997 mayor's race had so much absentee ballot fraud that the judge threw out the results of the election. 25,000 absentee ballots. So voter fraud or election crimes do happen. But not impersonation fraud. And that's what a voter ID law is meant to Effect. So why this focus on voter ID? Now, some claim the intent is to suppress the Democratic vote, and Professor Ortiz talked about this a little bit. I think that's part of the story. I don't think that's a big part of the story. I think a bigger part of the story is that it's meant to excite the Republican base, that the votes are going to be stolen. So here's an email that came out during the 2006 uh, investigation of the U.S. attorney scandal, where a number of U.S. attorneys during the Bush administration were fired for no apparent reason. And it turned out that uh, there was a guy named David Iglesias, lifelong Republican, very um, well-respected lawyer, who was the U.S. attorney in New Mexico, and he was being pressured by Republican activists to indict someone from ACORN, a group that uh, engaged in uh, voter registration activities, I'm going to talk about them in a minute, to indict uh, someone from that group for election fraud. Here's an email that went to a bunch of Republicans and to the U.S. attorney. I believe the voter ID issue should be used now at all levels, federal, state, legislative races, and Heather Wilson's race. You are not going to find a better wedge issue. Indict that woman now. This is going to help us win our election. So a big part of the push for voter ID to claim that Democrats are trying to steal the election is to get Republicans to turn out to vote and to fundraise. Okay. Well, what about ACORN? ACORN was a group. They're still attacked, even though they haven't been in existence for four years. They're still attacked as trying to steal the election. ACORN had what I consider a broken business model. They hired very poor people who were desperate for jobs, and they said, go out and register people to vote. And if you don't turn enough registration forms, you're going to be fired. We don't have a strict quota, but you got to perform. So here's a form from Mr. Um, it may be hard to read. Uh, first name Mickey, last name Mouse. Uh, lots of these forms. Tony Romo, turns out, registered a lot in Texas. Yeah, but we can't find a single case where one of these fraudulent voters has actually, uh, fraudulently registered voters, has actually been registered and successfully voted. The fraud here is to try and get money from ACORN, as opposed to to try and steal the election. So this stuff happens, but what you see is, and this goes back to uh, the American Center for Voting Rights, kind of bait and switch. There's a lot of registration fraud, the potential for elections to be stolen equals 
the election's going to be stolen. And by the way, if you register as Jive F. Turkey Jr. and you show up to vote, you know, don't you think people are going to be suspicious? So it just doesn't happen very much. So uh, that's what happened there. And in part because of this, ACORN ended up being attacked, vilified, and is now uh, out of the voter registration business. Which brings me to the question of voter suppression. If the intent here at least is at least in part to make it harder for Democrats to vote, how prevalent is this? Well, Democrats love to tell the voter suppression story, and they love to say that it's a big problem. So there was a great story after Indiana and the Crawford case passed the voter ID law. It's the first election uh, that's held under the voter ID law, and there's this great story that AP runs about these nuns. They're, the nuns are holding, uh, a, a, there's an election at the convent, and the, uh, um, one of the nuns is the poll worker. She's working at the polls. And two nuns come in, one in her 80s, the other in her 90s, and they're not allowed to vote because they don't have ID. They don't drive. They live on the convent. They have no need for the kind of ID that would be good enough for uh, Indiana's law. And so these poor nuns have been disenfranchised. Nuns would never commit fraud, right? Now, it turns out in this last election, we had a nun that's just about to plead guilty to committing fraud. She voted for a dead sister, uh, voted her absentee ballot, again with absentee ballots that the fraud took place. But great story from the AP about the poor nuns who are being disenfranchised. What the story didn't mention is that if you were over 65, in, as both of these uh, nuns were in Indiana, you could vote absentee without an ID. Were they disenfranchised? Now, they may not like voting absentee. They may prefer to vote the voting place. But to call them literally disenfranchised, I don't think that's the case. And in fact, there's a reason, and this goes back to Joe's point uh, earlier, uh, there's a reason that uh, the plaintiffs in all of these cases have a really hard time, the institutional plaintiffs, the, uh, the public interest law firms that bring these, finding real people who, one, lack an ID, two, can't easily get the ID, and three, want to vote. Right? The concern here is not mostly with those people. There aren't that many, and we know from the Pennsylvania voter ID trial, there aren't that many of those people. Now, in Pennsylvania, there was going to be a problem because they were rolling it out too quickly, but generally speaking, the number of people who lack ID, can't get ID, and want to vote seems to be pretty small. So what do we know? Michael Pitts did a study of the 2008 Indiana election with the ID. 2.8 million voters cast ballots. 1,000 showed up without ID and cast provisional ballots. A lot of those people were people who left the ID in the, in the kitchen and didn't bring it with them. Not people who lack ID. Because if you lack ID, you're probably not, and you know you don't have it, you're probably not going to bother showing up. 137 of them got their votes counted. So what does this tell us? We don't know how many people are deterred who never showed up, didn't have the ID, and couldn't vote. We don't know how many of those are, but we have no reason to believe that it's a very large number. And there's a huge discrepancy between what some of the polling shows about people who lack ID and the people who actually, if you try and find them, who don't have the ID. So maybe, you know, maybe we're talking 1%. We don't know what the number is, but it seems to be low, not as was claimed by a, 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 an advocacy group in the, the election, 10 million Latinos without ID, uh, Latino voters. That's almost all the Latino voters in the country, right? So it's just the numbers uh, don't add up. So now, now here's what the Brennan Center said, and as hard as it is to say this in front of Keisha, I actually gave this presentation at the Brennan Center. It was a little bit more difficult. Brennan Center issued a study where they said new voting restrictions may affect more than 5 million. May affect. The Brennan Center is very careful. May affect. Now, of those 5 million, about 2 million were people who voted early in the weekend before the election in Florida and Ohio who were maybe not going to get that opportunity uh, to vote the last weekend. They'd still be able to vote on other days early voting or absentee or in person on election day. But may affect. Right, but so look at what the left does with this. Here's, uh, this is the Huffington Post. Brennan Center, millions of voters impacted by new idea. A little stronger, impacted. Uh, Daily Coast. Five million voters have been targeted by the GOP School of Election Engineering. And Rolling Stone. GOP war on voting. New laws could block five million from the polls. So now they're disenfranchised. All five million of them, including the millions who will have 23 days to vote in Ohio and will have an absentee ballot application sent to them and who will be able to vote on election day. Disenfranchised? A little bit of exaggeration. So what is this about? I claim that Democrats do the same thing as Republicans in terms of using this issue to get the base excited and to 
turn out to vote and to fundraise. So here's Donna Brazil, noted Democratic um, uh, activist and uh, an official. When my sister tried to vote in Florida in the 2000 election, she was a victim of voter suppression in Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Texas. Extremist governors or legislators are willing to violate our people's civil rights in order to win elections. Send money now. Right? So that's a big part of what this is about, too. But it's not the only story with what's wrong with our elections. I wish that the only story were about these fights between the parties. But the bigger problem is one of of partisanship in how elections are run and, and incompetence. So here's uh, Ken Blackwell, who was the Secretary of State and also co-chair of the Bush uh, re-election committee in 2004 in Ohio. He issued a number of controversial rulings, which all of which tended to favor Republicans, including a ruling that said that if you turned in your voter registration form and it wasn't on the right weight of paper, that it would not be counted. And he was replaced by a Democrat, Jennifer Bruner. Jennifer Bruner said, I'm going to run this election so fairly, no one's going to know my name. I'm going to be anonymous. It's going to be great. And then she said, you know, the Republicans had sent out a form for absentee ballot form for people to turn in to get their absentee ballots in Ohio. For the McCain campaign sends this out, and there's a little box that you could check on the form that says, yes, I am a citizen and I'm ready to vote. And that was not required by Ohio law, that box. But Bruner took the position that, well, if you didn't check that box, I'm not counting your vote. And uh, so... People knew her name. In fact, uh, here's John Gibson on Fox News. Someone's trying to steal your election, Jennifer Bruner. We have partisans running our elections. No other civilized, advanced democracy do we have this kind of situation. And then we had John Husted, who came in after, Republican. He had a mixed record. And we could talk about that. But he did some things like fighting voter ID, which uh, was not seen in line with Republicans. He did other things like how he voted on what the hour should be for early voting, which seemed to benefit Republicans. Um, but the problem are, is not the people. It's the fact that we're, we've got a swing state, a highly polarized state, and we're letting partisans run our elections. But even worse than that is the problem of localism. The problem that we have people with different resources and levels of competence running our elections. So in Ohio, if you go to vote, you might go to a gymnasium or someplace, and there are multiple places where you can vote in, within the gymnasium. You have to vote at the right table, at the right precinct. Otherwise, under Ohio law, your vote won't count. So you walk in and you ask for a ballot and you're told what table to go to. So part of the ta what tells you what table you're going to go to is your address. So here's the deposition of a poll worker who is explaining why the house number 798, whether it was even or odd, to decide which table to go to. Uh, when asked whether the house number 798 was even or odd, the poll worker responded, odd. A and why do you say the address is an odd address? Because it begins with an odd number. It starts with an odd number. Yes, nine is an odd number. Eight's even. So on election day, if someone uh, came in with an address 798 and you had two ranges to choose from, you'd choose odd for them? Yes. OK, so that's how you did it for all the ballots you looked up on election day? To determine they were even? Yes. To determine they were even or odd, you looked at the first digit of the address? No. I looked at the whole address. And you would choose if there were more odds than even numbers, it would be an odd address? Yes. Everybody knows that. 798, odd, odd, even. It's an odd number, right? It's second grade math. We all learned that. Funny, except people were being disenfranchised, and the Ohio Supreme Court said, that's just fine. It took a ruling from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, a federal court, actually three very conservative judges on that court, to say, you can't disenfranchise someone. Someone can't lose their franchise because the poll worker doesn't know that 798 is an even number. So we said, let's try and fix this. We set up the U.S. Election Assistance Commission in 2002. The U.S. Election Assistance Commission, here's their website. I don't know if you can see, there are four commissioners, two Democrats, two Republicans, vacant, vacant, resigned, resigned. We went through the entire election season with no commissioners on the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Republicans blocking any appointments to the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. The National Association of Secretaries of State, which is the body of all these chief election officers, since the day the EAC was formed, its only job was to give out money for voting machines and to provide best practices, too powerful. So the other thing that's going on is a turf war between federal, state, and local governments as to who's going to run our elections. That's part of what's at issue in this other voting case before the Supreme Court, involving Arizona's citizenship requirement for voting. So it brings us to 2012. So who are, who are the faces of 2012? So here's one of them. Do you recognize her? That's Desilene Victor. She was at the State of the Union, 102-year-old woman, waited in line for hours to vote in Florida because the lines were so long. We have to fix that, said President Obama, and people cheered. This is the Democrats' face of the 2012 election. 
And here's Meloise Richardson. You may not recognize her. She was a poll worker in Cincinnati. She was interviewed by the local TV station. And she said, yeah, I voted twice. I wanted Obama to win. I voted an absentee ballot, and I voted in person. And it turned out she voted for her granddaughter, too, twice. Once in person and once an absentee ballot. That's the other face of the 2012 election. An election overrun by fraud, an election where we're suppressing the vote of people who you know, uh, should not have to endure this. The voting wars continued in 2012, but things changed in 2012. First, we saw a Republican legislative overreach between 2008 and 2012. We saw an interesting public response, a court response, and then I want to talk about post-election reactions in the future. So here's a page from the Brennan Center. No question about it. It was only in Republican states where restrictive voter laws were passed. Uh, voter ID, cutbacks in early voting, making it harder to register people to vote. That happened. It wasn't the secretaries of state who were doing the manipulating of the election rules. It was the legislatures. In states with one-party legislatures, they were doing this. Democratic states were doing other things. They were making it easier for people to vote. So now I'm talking about let's let 16-year-olds vote. Let's let felons vote. In Democrats claim the high road by saying we're going to increase the franchise. What they don't tell you is increasing the franchise is going to help Democrats. There's a self-interest here, too. These laws, what was different about this uh, cycle compared to last cycle, is that many of these laws were blocked. Many of these laws were blocked by courts, at least temporarily. Wisconsin's voter ID law, Pennsylvania's voter ID law, put on hold. South Carolina's voter ID law approved, but put on hold. Texas's law blocked. Early voting restrictions changed, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So one thing that's different is the courts woke up. And the courts, unlike in the last elections, were not dividing on party lines. So that was interesting. And then we saw public action. This is Sarah Silverman in her video called Get Nana a Gun. The idea is get the grandmother a gun, then she can get a concealed weapons permit, and she'd be able to register to vote. Um, voter ID and these issues broke through the public consciousness. My mother uh, was talking on the phone in October. She said, What's this with the voter ID laws? Are they trying to make it harder for people to vote? I said, Mom, I've been doing this for five years. I just wrote a book about this. Read the book. <laughs> but it broke through in a way that, that was different than before. And the judicial reaction was really interesting. So in the Ohio early voting case, remember Ohio gave 23 days of early voting. Everybody got an absentee ballot application. You could go vote on election day. But on the last weekend, the Republican legislature said, we're cutting back for everybody. Except they, they're so incompetent in Ohio that they messed up and didn't withdraw it for everybody. They let military and overseas voters still be able to vote in person on those days. Democrats went to court. I called it impossible. Ned Foley called it a Hail Mary pass. But the Democrats won. And the legal theory, I thought, was very weak, advanced by the court, as to why uh, this was an equal protection violation. But one of the judges, uh, Judge White, in her concurrence said, I don't think that taking away the last weekend of early voting is a big burden on voters. They do have these other things. But I don't trust Ohio to be able to run its election competently. We know in 2004 there were long lines. We know there were big problems. Let's put it back in place. And then even the conservative judges on the Sixth Circuit, in the case involving the wrong precinct voting, said, we're relying on Bush versus Gore, the case from 2000 that handed the election to George Bush. We're going to say it's an equal protection violation to not count someone's vote when all they did was show up at the polling place and lacked uh, the, a competent poll worker to tell them where to vote. Bush versus Gore finally, at least in the Sixth Circuit, making some lemonade from lemons. But there were still problems. So here's a picture from Miami. One study, which I'm not sure that I buy, but one study says up to 200,000 Florida voters were deterred by the long lines. That strikes me as a very <laughs> large number. but, but um, but we'll see. But many, no question, long lines. I remember when President Obama was giving his acceptance speech, I was watching on Twitter, there were still people online in Miami voting. That's ridiculous. President Obama, we have to fix that. He said it three times. He said it in the inauguration speech. He said it in the State of the Union. He said it in, uh, um, what am I missing? His, uh, his acceptance speech. Uh, uh, so he said it three times. Uh, fix the long lines. What should we do? So one proposal I have is that we make the federal government register all voters, proactively go out, register all voters, give you a national ID card. And if you want, you could use your thumbprint, if you want. And because you may forget your card, but you're never going to forget your thumb. You could always use your thumb. I like to say this is a proposal that has united Democrats and Republicans. It's united them against the idea. Democrats hate voter ID. Republicans hate universal voter registration. 
So, you know, there are lots of things we could do. Now we're going to have a commission headed by uh, Bob Bauer and Ben Ginsburg, uh, the, the top Obama election lawyer, the top Romney election lawyer. They're going to issue a report. They're going to issue best practices. I thought that's what the United States Election Assistance Commission was supposed to do. So we, our, our faith in fixing the process depends on a report that's going to issue recommendations which states may or may not pay attention to in an era of red election law and blue election law that doesn't seem like it's going to get very far. So what are the chances we're going to have another election meltdown like Florida? Well, I say the odds of it happening in any one election are low because you'd have to have a state be really, really close and it would have to be a state that affects the outcome of a presidential election. But if we do have a meltdown, it's going to be much worse because people are aware of all of these rules. We now have social media. People are more partisan and polarized than they were in 2000. And so what's the answer? I want to suggest that the answer is to be found in religion. It's the election administrator's prayer, which is, Lord, let this election not be close. <laughs> because what's going to save us is not that we fix the system. We have to fix that, but we're not fixing that. And I don't see that we're going to fix it before 2012. Uh, despite the efforts of Pew and others to make things better, I, I, I see a continuing churn. And so we have to just hope for a landslide. And if we get a landslide, then we'll be okay. If not, I really worry about our democracy. And I look at the pictures of Tahrir Square, and I worry about what this country would be like if the election results came down to what they came down to in Wisconsin in that summer of 2011, 200 votes apart, and a partisan election official with the key votes stored on her laptop. And that's no way to run a democracy. Thanks very much. <laughs>